love the book of Ephesians. I'm kind of biased toward it because it's one of the few that, that I had to really take it apart word for word at seminary, uh, nuance for nuance and bounce it against things. But one of the most powerful things in this Ephesians 4 writing is right down there in the beginning where it talks about the grace of God is given to each one of us according to our measure. And what is grace? I mean, we hear it all the time, we talk about it all the time, but really, when you think about it, what is grace? And grace, when you look it up, it's, it's most important concept for all of us as Christians. I mean, it really is. I mean, we can say royalty have grace when they walk around their castles or when they walk around their, their uh, people. But as Christians, grace is the foundation of why we're here. And, 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 and I'm not saying that grace is not important. I'm saying that grace is the most important thing. Now, I'm sort of a professional when it comes to grace. And I think each of us needs to look at ourselves that way, that we're a professional when it comes to grace. And we get better at it because all professionals, I mean, if you see, uh, Mary and I used to teach a, a marriage enrichment course. And when we were at uh, King of Peace, we ran it a couple times over there. And people loved it because we used to open up with this one saying, saying, listen, as a marriage, are you practicing to be a better husband and wife? And most people say, well, what do you mean practice? We just go through it. Well, all right, if you're a major baseball player, do you say, okay, I, I hit, you know, a three, I have a 3-3 three, three or 3-0 three oh average all year, so I'm not going to practice anymore? No, they're up there practicing all the time, and we need to do the same thing in a marriage. But that also has to play into what we are as Christians, and that's what makes you a professional, because you're going to get better at it as you practice grace. It is clearly the most important expression of the promises that God has revealed in Scripture and embodied in His Son, Jesus Christ. I mean, we heard about a little bit in 2 Kings where it talks about a little bit about God's grace. He said to the one prophet, yeah, I'm going to take your buddy away, but I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to make you more powerful than he was. I mean, we didn't even get into my favorite reading in 2 Kings, 2 Kings 2.23. And along the way to Bethel, Elijah was going to Bethel. And these kids came out of the, of the village and jeered at him, go up, you bald head, go up, you baldy. And he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. It's in there. Don't mess with God's prophets, because his grace will abound. God made him a more powerful prophet than his predecessor, than his mentor. And the same thing happens with us as Christians. The grace is the love of God shown to the unloving, to the unlovely, to the ugly. It is God's love is shown to them. The peace of God given to the restless, the unmerited favor of God. That's what grace is. The beautiful blessing that we have at the end here. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds and knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God, we're passing the grace on to each other, reminding us when we go outside these doors, God's grace has got to go on. The great John Stott, who we have plenty of his books in the back here, we're even studying his uh, Bible study on the book of Revelation, who really opened up for us a little bit of the book of Revelation to us, he defines grace as this. Grace is love that cares and stoops and rescues. Wow, I love it. I love it. But let's get into a little bit more looking at grace from a definition of, of from the biblical aspect. Instead of these Christian writers, let's look at exactly what God has said. Our Christian identity comes out of 1 Corinthians 1.10. It says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. I am what I am. And that's taking a lot on for us, isn't it? Because we already know that when Jesus had said, 
before Pilate, I am. They called it blasphemy because that was exactly what God had called himself. So in order for us to say, by the grace of God, I am what I am, we take on Jesus' cloak. Or how about in Romans, Paul goes on to say, our standing before God is this, the grace in which we stand. So define that. What is it? What makes us Christians so special? Well, grace is nothing more than believing in Christ Jesus that when he went to the cross on Good Friday, he died for our sins. That anything we did is redeemed through his blood, not on our own actions. So you're not going to get into heaven. You're not going to be better with God if you say, God, I'm going to do this for this homeless person because I want to feel better. That's not what grace is about. And God is looking at you saying, yeah, okay. You're just trying to sell yourself cheap. I want to show you what real important grace was when I put my son upon the cross. Or how about 2 Corinthians 2.12, our behavior. We behave in the world by the grace of God. And this comes into play as to how do we look at ourselves and say, I've been saved by the blood of Jesus. Now, what am I going to do with that? Am I going to forgive myself, which most people do not have the ability to do for some reason? You'll forgive other people before you forgive yourself what you did wrong. Stop it now. We'll be like that blonde woman in the 80s. Stop the madness! You know, whatever her name was, that, that, that woman that talked about food and fitness and all that stuff. Susan Powers. Susan, Susan, who is it? Susan Powers. Susan Powers. That's it. Stop the madness! You know, I mean, that's really part of our problem. We're so Because we're living in the already and the not yet. We just sit there on top of that fence and we say, okay, I forgive this person for beating me up, but I'm not going to forgive myself because I hit my child, or whatever the case may be. you got to stop the madness. You need to forgive yourselves. It's God's grace that abounds not only in how you were forgiven before God, but now how you have to forgive yourself. Or are living those who receive the abundance of grace, the free gift of righteousness, reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ, Romans 5. And by the grace of life, 1 Peter 1.7, so I'm not just pulling it, I'm going across the board. How about this from 2 Timothy? Again, I'm shifting back to Paul. Our holiness. God's called us to be a holy calling because of his own purpose and grace. Now, part of God's grace is that gift that Paul keeps talking about. What is it? It's opening our eyes to our sinful nature. It's opening our eyes to what I've done wrong, that, that sin that was not known to me in my heart when I did it. But afterwards, you look back and say, I, I didn't mean to do that. But now you've blessed me by opening my eyes, so I see that gift. I see where I was wrong, or I see where I was right. That is called the truth of God. How about our strength for living? God's grace and our strength for living. This again I stole from Paul and the writer of Hebrews, 2 Timothy 2.1. Be strengthened by the grace that is in Jesus Christ, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. So it's not only calling from Paul, it's coming from the writer of Hebrews. Our way of speaking. Let our speech always be what? Gracious. Always be gracious. As I was taught very young, it's always easier to get bees with honey than it is with salt. So let our speaking be gracious. Our serving. We serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Who gave that one up? Peter. Now, Peter said it. We already know Paul is big on grace, but Peter's been on it too. Our sufficiency. May grace, my grace is sufficient for you, right? That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that you having all sufficient in all things at all times, you may be abound in every good work. Our response, how about for those of us that are going through difficulties? And I know in, in the past couple months with Mary and I, we've really been going through some suffering and difficulties. We've lost a lot of good friends. We've had major changes in our life. And this was the mantra that we used was Hebrews and Peter. 
We get grace to help in the time of need. That's from Hebrews. What a great writer. And when you have suffered a little, while the God of all grace will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and what? Reestablish you by his grace. How about on participation when we walk out these doors? How do you act in public? As recipients of grace, we are privileged. I mean, really think about it. You're privileged to serve as agents of grace. And we never really look at that. Most Christians don't look at that. But if you want to be a, become a disciple of Christ, you have to. You have to look at everything. So believers receive grace. This is on Acts 11 are encouraged to continue in grace, Acts 13, are called to testify in grace of God, Acts 20. And Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, even so what? I am sending you. God's grace, that came out of John. God's mission is the entire world to know and feel and be pushed onto by grace. So what about our future? God in his grace is everlasting, right? This is set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, come from 1 Peter. Now, in all this, if you open up to the very last page of the Bible, okay? So as a test, I want you to open up your Bibles and go to the last line, which is Romans 22, 21. This is how important grace is in a Christian life. Somebody want to read that very last line written by St. John. The grace of the Lord Jesus will be with you. Amen. Amen. That's how important God's grace is to God and to the Christian believers. That even the last words of the Bible are about grace. How do you forgive the unforgiving? How do you lovingly care for the unloving and the ugly? It's through God's grace. That's how we get where we are as, as Christians. So think about it a little bit. That undeserving gift, because we don't deserve it. We don't. We don't deserve grace. But we take it gleefully. If somebody is willing to pay off your mortgage and you do nothing at all, gleefully walk to the bank or run or skip like a ram to the bank and get that mortgage paid off. That's exactly what grace is. But that does not give you carte blanche to do whatever you want. That's cheap grace. And too often we see presbyters and priests practicing that and proclaiming that, that it doesn't matter what you do, God's going to forgive you. There has to be a transformation of the heart. The grace has got to be not a superficial thing, but you need to take in the importance of what God's grace cost him. He had to put his son on the cross. That blood is the most powerful and most expensive blood ever produced. It cost him his life, but he rose from the dead. But it cost us nothing, and we too will raise from the dead. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen.